thank you so much. I'm moved almost to the point of tears thinking of the Lordship of Christ and that the battle is over. We have been studying through the book of Revelation in our Sunday morning worship services. And John outlines the book in three parts in chapter 1, verse 19. This is God's outline for the book of Revelation. The Lord tells John to write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which are to come after these. First, the things he has seen. John has written of the exalted vision of Christ in chapter 1. Secondly, the things which are the seven churches of Asia in chapters 2 and 3. And third, the things which shall be after these, beginning at chapter 4, verse 1. So today we finish the second division of Revelation, the things which are the seven churches of Asia Minor. And you'll want to turn in your Bible to Revelation chapter 3, and in just a moment we'll begin reading in verse 14 and read through the end of the chapter in verse 22. Now John did not select under the leadership of the Holy Spirit these seven churches because there were only seven churches in Asia Minor. There were many more churches than these, but seven in the Bible is a number of completion. So when John writes to the seven churches, he's writing to the whole body of Christ. Beyond that, many Bible scholars believe that these seven churches are an outline of the entire age of the church between the first coming of Jesus and the second coming of Jesus. The first of the seven is Ephesus. That's the church right at the end of of the apostolic age where the church has begun to lose its first love. The seventh and last church is the church of Laodicea where Jesus is standing on the outside and knocking. That's the church of falling away, the church of apostasy just before Jesus Christ comes again. But in addition, John is writing to seven literal churches with literal problems. In every age of the church, we find Ephesus churches and Smyrna churches and Laodicean churches, but also these represent different kinds of Christians the Ephesus Christian who is losing his first love, the Smyrna Christian who is suffering, the Pergamos Christian who is married to the world, and the Laodicean Christian who is lukewarm. So we're reading not only God's word to the church, but God's word to you and God's word to me as we are the members of the body of Christ. So, in chapter 3, verse 14, John begins the last letter of our Lord Jesus Christ to the church at Laodicea. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea, write, The Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, says this, I know your deeds that you are neither cold nor hot. I would that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spit you out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich and have become wealthy 
and have need of nothing, and you do not know that you are poor and miserable and poor and blind and naked, I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire that you may become rich and white garments that you may clothe yourselves and that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and I salve to anoint your eyes that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Be zealous therefore and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. He who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Of these seven churches in Revelation, there are two churches of which Jesus says nothing bad. One is Smyrna, the church in persecution. And the other is the church we looked at last week, Philadelphia, the church of the open door, the mission-minded church, the outreach-minded church. But there is one church of the seven of whom the Lord says absolutely nothing good. And that's the church we're studying today, the church at Laodicea. Now the town of Laodicea was founded about 250 B.C. by a Syrian king. And he named it after his wife, Queen Laodicea. So the town is named after a queen. It is very close to two other churches that are named in the New Testament. The church at Colossae, to which the book of Colossians was written, is only 11 miles away from Laodicea. And the church at Hierapolis, and Hierapolis simply means the sacred city. The church at Hierapolis, Hierapolis, which is also mentioned in the book of Colossians, is only six miles away. So the Lord speaks to this church at Laodicea. And he says, I have a concern about you that you are lukewarm. Lukewarm church. That means they are not committed. And the message is that Jesus wants the church at Laodicea to be totally committed to him. The Lord wants this church to be totally committed to him. The Lord wants you and the Lord wants me as individual believers to be totally committed to him. So God's word to the church today is the word commitment. Someone said, a wise man learns from the mistakes of others, but a fool is condemned to learn from his own. Even from a lukewarm church, you and I can learn important spiritual lessons. And I want to share with you four from the passage this morning. Lesson number one, churches have spiritual temperatures. People run spiritual temperatures. The normal human temperature, 98.6 degrees, or within about a degree of that one way or the other. More than a degree higher and you have a fever. Too much lower than that, and you may have hypothermia. When I was a little baby, I suffered from a high fever, which drove me into a convulsion, 
And for a while, the physicians back then thought I had polio because polio was still a rampant disease. There were still people living in iron lungs. And the salt vaccine had not yet been introduced. So they did a spinal tap on me as a little baby to verify that I did not have polio because my temperature was so high. When my son was just a little baby, 18 months old or so, he suffered from a high fever and as a result had what they then called a benign febrile seizure. He too went into a convulsion just as his father had. So physically, a normal temperature is a sign of good health. And the same thing is true spiritually. Cold means that you're not on fire at all for the Lord. Lukewarm means that you're just sort of indifferent and half-hearted. Hot is a normal spiritual temperature for the Christian. And it means that you are on fire, you are totally committed to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now notice how Jesus introduces himself in verse 14. He says, first of all, I am the amen. The word amen means this is true or so let it be. So Jesus is saying, I am the truth and what I'm about to tell you is true. Then Jesus introduces himself as the faithful and true witness. The Lord is getting ready to give a witness about the conditions of the church in Laodicea. And he says, this is a witness on which you can absolutely rely. And third, he describes himself as the beginning of all creation. Don't misunderstand that. That does not mean that Jesus was the first of created beings, no. The New Testament teaches that Jesus is God himself. And to be the first of creation means to be the source of creation. It means to be the beginning from which all other things and beings by whom all other created things and beings flow forth. John chapter 1 Verse 3 says, All things were made by him, speaking of Jesus. And without him was not anything made that was made. And again in Colossians 1, 16, the Bible says, For all things were created by him, whether they be things in heaven or things on earth, visible or invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him, and through him all things hold together. So Jesus is the source of creation. Now he says to the church at Laodicea, you are lukewarm. Laodicea was located a few miles from hot springs. The Romans were fond of building towns near hot springs. And they piped the water from the hot springs into the town. They made the pipe of big slabs of stone, limestone. Each slab was about two and a half feet long, about one foot wide, and about one foot deep. And they drilled holes through the middles, the middle of these blocks of limestone so that when you put the blocks of limestone together, one after the other, you had a tunnel. That was their kind of water pipe. And they piped the water from the hot springs to the saunas where people took their hot baths. But this water was mineral water. And when it was hot, it gave you a wonderful sauna. 
I suppose if it were ice cold and you dipped into it, it would be cold and refreshing. But in between, it was lukewarm. And the taste of the mineral water was such that if you would drink it lukewarm, it would nauseate you and maybe even cause you to vomit. So Jesus is saying, you're lukewarm. You're less than committed. You're half-hearted. And that nauseates me. And I want to spew you out of my mouth. So I ask you this morning, as part of the body of Christ, what is your spiritual temperature? Joseph Parker used to say, without enthusiasm, the church is Mount Vesuvius without fire. Without enthusiasm, the church is Niagara Falls with no water. And without enthusiasm, the church is the sky without a sun. The main enemy of the church today is not opposition externally, though there's a lot of that. The primary enemy of the church is half-heartedness on the inside. If we were to measure your spiritual temperature by your attendance, how would it stack up? If we were to measure your spiritual temperature by your work and your service, what would it be? If we were to measure your spiritual temperature by your giving, what would it be? If we were to gauge your spiritual temperature by your prayer life, what would it be? That's the first lesson Jesus teaches us here that churches and Christians have spiritual temperatures. What is yours? The second lesson he gives us in verses 17 and 18, that churches and Christians can be materially wealthy and spiritually in poverty. Notice what he says in verse 17. Because you say I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Now let's stop right there for a moment. The town of Laodicea was noted, besides its mineral water and hot springs, for three things. First of all, it was noted for its wealth. It was the banking center of all of Asia Minor. It was the Wall Street of that whole subcontinent. Secondly, it was the center of the world's wool industry. And in Laodicea, they produced a special black wool which had a shine or a sheen to it. It was very rare and very expensive. If you bought Laodicean wool, you didn't buy it at Belk's or Dillard's or Cole's. It was the wool that you would buy at Neiman Marcus or Bergdorf Goodman in New York. So they were known for their luxurious cloth. And third, the greatest medical center in the world was located at Laodicea. And in particular, they produced an eye ointment or an eye salve which was supposed to help inflamed or damaged eyes. So notice in verse 17, Verse 18, Jesus says, I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire that you may become rich. You have the banking industry. That's material. You need to get my gold, spiritual wealth. And white garments, not your black wool, 
that you may clothe yourselves and that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. Turn in your rags and get my white garments of righteousness. And I salve to anoint your eyes that you may see. You pride yourselves in your eye salve that you sell. What you need is spiritual eye salve so that you may see spiritually. Do you see the lesson? Churches can be materially wealthy and spiritually dead broke. There was a church back in the 1930s during the oil boom in Texas. A church just outside of Palestine, a little rural church in East Texas. Oil was discovered on the church property. All of a sudden, this congregation went from being poor and rural to filthy oil rich, kind of like Jeb Clank, Clampett. And they got together in a business meeting and they discussed what are we going to do with the oil royalties. And there were a couple of people in the church that said, look what we can do for missions. Look what we can do for the kingdom. But most of the people in the church wanted to go another way. So in business meeting, they passed two motions. The first one was to close the membership of the church so that nobody else could join. Not by letter, not by profession of faith in Christ, not by baptism. They closed the church membership. And then the second motion, they would disband the church and divide equally the oil royalties among all the remaining members of the church. And they all became rich. Now, they had to pass that first motion to close the membership. If they hadn't, that little rural church could have become a mega church overnight if they had passed the second motion. But they said, we'll close the membership, disband our witness for Christ, and divide up the money. Would you say materially rich? But would you also say spiritually poor? A man had a dream in which he and his wife were walking down a country lane. And they came to the end of the lane, and in front of them was an open grave, meaning that they were nearing the end of life and they were going to die. In the dream, on the other side of the open grave, he saw the pearly gates of heaven. And to the side of the grave, he saw a pile of trash and junk. And then an angel appeared and asked the question, what is this that you have in your hands? The man was carrying a sack of gold and the woman was carrying a jewelry box full of her diamonds. And so the couple said to the angel, this is the wealth that we have been able to accumulate in our lifetimes. The angel said, take the bag of gold and take the jewel chest and throw it over here on the trash pile. And they looked at him askance. And he said, in heaven, we pave our streets with gold and walk on it. And in heaven, the foundations of the city are huge and they are made of those precious stones and you just have a few dinky little stones. They mean nothing. And then the angel said, what we value here is souls. Now I hope for you, every one of you, material prosperity. But I want to ask every one of you and ask myself, how much do we value souls? How courageous are you willing to be to talk to a soul? 
How much effort are you willing to put forth to talk to a soul? How much of your prayer time is spent praying about souls and how much about material things? Huh? A church can be materially wealthy and spiritually impoverished. Lesson number three, like individuals, a church can come under the discipline of God. Now, there's a difference between punishment and discipline. God punishes the unbeliever. God disciplines his children. And another word for discipline is chastens. Notice what the risen Lord says in verse 19. Those whom I love, despite the fact that he has nothing good to say about this church, he says, I love you. Those whom I love, I reprove. The word reprove means to stack up evidence against. And discipline. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Have you ever been around a child that was totally undisciplined? Where the parent believed that all that love is is sentimental feeling and indulgence? On the other hand, have you been around children that were properly in love, well-disciplined, and they knew, their parents knew that love was more than a sentimental feeling, that love was a moral reality? So Jesus says, I discipline churches. I can send hardship into your church, but it's not a sign that I hate you. It's a sign that I love you and I want to bring you back. The Lord says to you as an individual Christian, I can send hardship into your life and discipline, but don't resent that. It's not an evidence. And don't say, God doesn't love me anymore. It's not an evidence that God hates you. It's an evidence that God cares as a parent cares for his children. Churches and Christians can come under God's discipline. But lesson number four, even lukewarm churches and Christians can be renewed and revived. Look at verses 20 and 21. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. The word dine is the word have supper. In the Greek world, they had a very light breakfast, maybe just a piece of bread or something to start the day. Likewise, they had a very light lunch. A working man would take like a picnic snack with him and he'd eat it standing alongside the street or maybe at his job site. The main meal of the night of the day was supper. At supper, you had your heavy meal. At supper, you had a long, drawn-out meal where people lingered and they just talked and they enjoyed fellowship with one another. And Jesus says to this church, if you invite me in, that's the kind of fellowship I want to have with you. He continues in verse 21, he who overcomes, that's the one who heeds the message and repents. I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. What a joy and what a blessing is that. But did you notice that even though the Lord is speaking to a church, when he makes an invitation, it's always to an individual. He says, I stand at the door and knock. He doesn't say if all of you. He says, if any one of you will hear my voice. He's speaking to the individual. 
and open the door, I will come in to him, one of you, and dine with him, one of you, and he, one of you, with me. God's salvation invitation is to you and to me as individuals. Martin Luther once said, Before my conversion, if you had asked, knocking at the door of my heart, who lives here? I would have told you, Martin Luther lives here. And had you come in the door, this is what you would have seen. A monk with his head shaved, sleeping in a night shirt made out of cheap hair, and to punish his flesh, sleeping on a bed using two stones for his pillow, and hanging at his bed a scourge so that every time he sinned in thought, in deed, or word, he would whip himself with that scourge. But now, he said, if you came and knocked on the door of my heart, the answer would be, Martin Luther used to live here, but Jesus the Lord lives here now. I want to ask you, if we were to knock on the door of your heart, would you say that? Jesus the Lord lives here now. Becoming a Christian is that simple, to open your heart and say, Lord Jesus, come in. Would you open your heart today? You can give him your past, and he will forgive your sins. Give him your present. He will give you the resources, the strength, the leadership that you need in your life. Give him your future, and you'll spend eternity with him in heaven instead of in separation from him in hell. It's as simple as that. Lord Jesus, come in, and he will come in and have that long fellowship meal with you and satisfy every need of your heart. Let's stand together. In just a moment, we're going to sing together our song of invitation. And it may be that you would like to open your heart as an individual and ask Christ to come in. Do that just in the privacy of your own heart and mind. But then step out, and by your stepping out and coming forward, say, I want to confess Christ as my Savior. Jesus said, if you will confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father, which is in heaven. It may be that you'd like to come today and join First Baptist Church in moving your membership. Or come today, or just where you are, in your time of prayer, recommit your heart and your life to the will of God. And say, Lord, I want to be totally committed to you. As we sing, would you let Jesus come into your heart? Let's sing it together.